Hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn with another episode that we hope will bless you. Very, very deep and heavy subject tonight. So, um, and I make no apologies. I'm going to say some things tonight that uh, should not be controversial because anyone that has any historical, uh, anybody that's worth their historical salt, okay, will know that what I'm saying is true, but there's some things that I'm going to say about the nation of Israel tonight that are biblical, and they're not only biblical, they're, they're founded in history. And uh, I don't ask that, uh, that you hear an apology from me for that, because I really don't care. I want to preach God's Word, and I want to tell the truth. And so time, sometimes the truth divides, right? Isn't that what Hebrews tells us? The Hebrews divides, uh, or Hebrews tells us the Word of God is quick and powerful quick's an old english word for make alive so it makes you alive but it's also powerful how is it powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword it's able to divide the bible says the bone from the marrow i mean it gets right down to the to the nitty-gritty of things right and and it's able also to divide the thoughts and the intentions of the heart how many of you know we live in a day today where people are trying to influence people revisionist historians revisionists are trying to rewrite history saying that this means that and this means that when the reality is and the truth says otherwise and so what the bible says when the truth comes out it, it should be able to divide what the intention is behind that and the intention is it's a lie and i'm going to start right off by asking you to turn to genesis chapter 12 verse 1 and we're going to hear about this 3800 year old promise that god made to abraham and that gives us a date setting for the nation of Israel, why Jewish people belong in that land. And while you're turning there, I'm going to say something kind of, kind of, kind of tough here, but I, I, just want to, I just want to get out of the gate with this, this idea, okay? Because we just had a, uh, we just had a, a representative from Michigan uh, be censored. And I'm not going to mention her name. I'm not going into politics. But I, I just want to, uh, she said she's been making a statement that I think some young Americans and, and some, some on the extreme left have made about this part of the world, and it's absolutely a lie. And the statement goes something like this, uh, from the river to the sea, okay, uh, Palestine should be made free, okay? I just want to break that down for just a second and tell you how bad that is. First of all, please, please, if it, very humbly and with love, if you have, hear anybody call this area of the planet Palestine, uh, with gentleness, correct them. That word is incorrect. It is, uh, it is an anti-Semitic word. Uh, let me give you the, the, the background to the word Palestine so that you can understand it a little bit better, okay? The word Palestine is a derivative of the word uh, Philistine. You, you, need to, you, you can check me on this. It's a derivative of the word Philistine. The word Palestine is the Greek word for Philistine. The Romans started using that word to describe the Jewish people in what was at one time the province of Judea. There's a good word to describe that area. That's a good word. Are you with me? Palestine is not a good word. They used it so that they could um, shame the Israelites by taking their sworn enemy, the Philistines, come on, and call them in their land by that name. So then later, we have Arabs, stay with me, we have Arabs using that name to describe themselves. They have nothing to do with that name, by the way. Historically, there's no, there's no historicity between that word and Arab people at all. If, and, and next week, I'll take you all the way back to Noah and show you that was a different son. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, the, the Arabs come from a different son. So, so they have no connection at all with the philistines so to say that from the river that'd be the jordan to the sea the mediterranean palestine must be made free you're saying all the jews must be killed it's what you're saying and, and, and at the same time you're using an anti-semitic device that is over two thousand years old that the romans used once they came in under titus of rome and sacked uh jerusalem so, so it, it, how's that for a starter? I know we're just having a great time here. 
yeah, that, okay. But, but just to help you get along here, there's some things being said in our culture that's just dead wrong. It's absolutely dead wrong. And, and, and I just praise God that an act w- uh, came about where someone was censored. I think that was the 26th time. It's only happened 25 times, and this is the 26th time that someone was censored. Oh, praise God for that. I mean, shut your mouth. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're just, you're wrong, wrong, wrong. And I know I got a lot of friends right now, but, uh, okay. So Genesis chapter 12, verse one is our text. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, now let me give you, let me give you the name for Abram here. This means high father. Abraham means father of nations. In, in, in English, there's more letters that make up that, where you go from Abram to Abraham. Okay. Uh, but in Hebrew, there's only one letter change. There's one letter added. You go from four letters to five letters. I'm going to show you what that means here in just, just a minute. But, but, but God said at this point, he's Abram, right? The covenant hasn't come across yet. His name hasn't been changed. He said, go from your country. Now, where would that be? On the other end of the Fertile Crescent, right? He's, he's um, part of the Ur of uh, Chaldea. He comes out of that area, comes up the Fertile Crescent. God's calling him to a land, right? He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you, watch this, a great nation. Now this is 3,800 years ago. This is long before this land is called even Canaan because that would be even more historically correct than Palestine. I understand that people use that term. Uh, the word Levant was also used by the French in World War I, after World War I. Then we have, uh, we have the... Uh, Great Britain has some control of the land. We have the Balfour Declaration, 1917. Then in 1948, Israel can be called Israel again. Um, There's no more accurate term for this land than Israel. Not only biblically, but also by possession indeed. God gave Abraham and his descendants through the child of promise, Isaac, not Ishmael. Hello. The title deed to this land forever. Hello. Hello. Are you with me? Forever. And it was an unconditional deed in that covenant. I'm going to show you that in a minute, okay? It says, to the land I will show you, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I want you to see something. I'm going to teach you something here. All of the blessings from God to Israel come to Israel and the children of Israel directly. Say directly. Directly. All the blessings come directly to Israel. But I want you to understand there's also an indirect blessing that comes to all the Gentiles, the nations, and the rest of the world. He says, I will bless you, and I will make you, and you will be a blessing. You see the indirect there? Say indirect. What I'm about to teach you is this, that when God wants to bless the world, he does it through Israel. Come on. And he has been doing it through Israel. He does it directly through Israel. And then as his chosen people, they have brought the world what? By the power of God. They have brought the world the word of god the truth of the one true god become a missionary nation to the nations for god and also brought about the birth of the messiah okay so that's why the blessings come directly to them indirectly to us through them watch how it's indirect here it is i will bless those who bless you this is this promise is still in effect right now so any american that is leading our country right now that says, you know what, we, don't, we, we need to resist what Israel's doing. But, oh, repent. I will bless those who bless you, and he who dishonors you I will curse. You see that? And in you all the families of the earth. What does all mean? All means all, right? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, indirectly. You see? How are, they, how are all the families of the earth blessed? Not directly from God. Through Israel. And their relationship with Israel. Bet you didn't know that. (sighs) Praise God you do now. So there's a place and there's a people that are a missionary nation to bless all nations. There's a place and a people to produce the Savior, the Messiah. And a place to defeat the Antichrist and Satan in the earth. It all happens at this place. I want to talk to you a little bit about why this is such a big deal say big deal deal. okay why is it a big deal i'll tell you why because when you pick up your bible 
if you, if you read it with a Western mentality, you're not getting it. You're not getting how God wants to do things and how God works, okay? If you pick up your Bible, you will see in the Old Testament the word Israel, and in the New Testament, you see it 2,500 times in the Old, 79 times in the New. You will see in the New Testament only, only in the New Testament, watch this, the word Christian three times. I, I just want to show you by, by ratio, most of what God is doing now in this dispensation of grace in the church is a blessing, but it's still coming through the lens that you see in your Bible of Israel. Hello. Let me put it to you another way. Jesus said this. He said, salvation is of... Who, who said that? God bless you. Salvation is of... Did you hear that correctly? Even your salvation is a result of what God did through this land and through these people. I'm not saying they saved you. Jesus did. But if they hadn't have been God's people and they hadn't have had this land, it wouldn't have produced the Messiah to give his life for you, for you to believe in and be saved. Jesus said that. That's a pretty big deal. So you say, why is it a big deal? I'll tell you why it's a big deal. We see that they're a unique nation. God calls them a special tre treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. Without them, we wouldn't have the written word of God. Like, like I said earlier, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, we wouldn't have salvation. It comes from the Jews, right? And everything comprehended in salvation through the Jews and the Holy Land comes from God's people in this place. So let's talk about why we need a promise. Now, this is going to get a little bit deep, but I think we'll have some fun with it. It's only, I wish I had a better illustration. You, you ever been in a talk and you were giving a talk to a bunch of people and you just wish you had a better illustration? No? No? Okay. Okay. Right now, I wish I had a better one, but this is all I got. Okay? I want to talk to you about title and deed. Now, most of you are homeowners. Most of you have owned a home at maybe at some point in your life. Maybe at some point you will own a home. But you need to know the difference between a title and a deed. Let me put it to you this way. Um, if you own your car, you get the title. Right? And when you get that title, in the state of Ohio, I think you, it, it, it ends up at the, 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 the Nazi Gestapo that keeps, yeah, that makes you go through. Yeah, oh, never mind. That's a joke. That's a joke. But you don't get your title, do you? Some states you do. And the, most, the worst thing you could do is get in your car and put that in the glove box and drive around with your title right anybody know why because if they got the title they got the they got possession right so titles have to be titles have to be protected right because a title represents the possession and so the way they do that in the real estate world is they have a deed a deed is given and it conveys the title, right? I used, to, I used to be a slumlord, so I know this stuff. But I used to sit down and I used to close on these old houses all the time. And so what you do at closing is, is you're signing a bunch of papers that basically say, A, mortgage, which you know, the root word is mortuary there, mortgage, payable till death. Um, you're saying at some point we'll convey this title, the bank's going to hold on to it, they're the ones that own it. But there's a deed floating around that is a piece of paper that spells out all that language, right? For spiritual things to enter from the supernatural to the natural world, right? God has a deed. He has the title. He, the title is the blessing. He wants to give the blessing to people, but he has to have a vehicle for it or a, an instrument for it. Or another word uh, might be some way to convey it. And the deed is very often anybody that will believe him. Today, the church is part of that. Do you realize that the blessings of God are for everyone? But if there isn't someone to, to represent the title and represent the deed of that blessing, it can't come from there to here. It's already there. It's already prepared. But God needs a believer. He set it up that way. And I want to tell you why. Because in the beginning, the, the idea of dominion of the earth was given to his kids. Right? 
And so God wants to take all the good things that he has and he wants to bring it through people who will believe him and then the people who believe him will then manifest that in all the earth. That is what Israel is. Israel is the promised land. Isaac is the promised, are you with me? The promised child. What is a deed? It's a promise of a title. What is the church today? You are people of promise. Peter says you're a peculiar people, a holy nation, right? It's you too. Kingdom of priests. And that's what Israel is. And the people of Israel are. What is a promise? What does he promise? Turn your Bibles to Genesis 15. And then I'm going to tell you why the world needs, why God made a promise. Why, why do it this way? I'm so glad that, you know, I did a little bit of, more of a study on this because it's like God could have done it any way he wanted. I mean, God could have just spoke brand new things into existence. And what if I told you he does? But the way that he does it in his redemption of creation and in his, um, in his recreation of creation, what if the way he speaks it is through his people and believers? Okay? In Genesis 15, 4, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abraham, right? It says, This man will not be your heir, but a son, who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. He took him outside, said, Look up at the sky, count the stars, if you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Verse 6, here is the gospel already in Genesis. You don't have to wait till you get to the book of Matthew. It's in Genesis. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited unto him righteousness. Boom, there it is. All God was looking for was a believer. The believer can be the deed. They carry the title. The title comes from the Lord. The Lord says, hey, this is yours. So Abraham believed. It was credited righteousness. That's the whole gospel story, by the way. It never changed. People say, well, there's an Old Testament and New Testament. I wish you preached more of the New. The whole Bible is one testament of Jesus. Come on. Hello. Verse 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. This is, watch this, this is 3,800 years, right, ago. Now everybody's saying, well, it belongs to this guy and it belongs to this guy. And these people were here for a little while. Let me tell you something. The Romans have been there. The Greeks have been there. The Seleucids have been there. Let me tell you something. We've had uh, the Ottoman Empire there. We've had the Crusaders there. We'd have, we've had every, we've had the Egyptians come through several times. One time, uh, the Egyptians came through and killed King Josiah. We've had every major nation in the world say it's theirs. But my God said it belongs to the Jews. Who, who conveys the title? The owner. And he's already said, I've deeded it to Abraham and his offspring. And it's going to be an heir. By the way, can I tell you something? When Ishmael was born, how many of you know that was a work of the flesh? The Bible tells us that. New Testament, it was work of the flesh. When Ishmael was born, he was named Ishmael because that means in Hebrew, God hears. Shema, Ishmael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The Shema, hear. That's what it means. El, God. Hears God. All right? Or God has heard. Abraham, what you talking about? I just read to you the verses where God had promised that the heir would come from, from him and his wife, not from Hagar. So was it, was it God that needed to hear and God finally heard us and gave us Ishmael? No, it was Abraham that needed to be reminded of what God had said. Can I just tell you the next thing you go and try to do in the flesh and you say, well, God promised this to me and it fails, don't give up the promise. This is what people do all the time. They go, well, I miss God. That part is true. <laughs> you did miss God, but God hasn't missed you. The promise is still... Many times the people of Israel in diasporas or in captivities have been hauled away out of the land and guess what God keeps doing? Keeps bringing them back. Whether it's the Babylonian Empire, whether it's the Persian Empire, whether it's the Assyrian, that's what took the north first, whether it was the Egyptians, God keeps bringing them back. And in 1948, God brought them back again. And this time to stay. See, God is the one that's going to keep the promise. 
I'm going to bring you to that in just a moment. But I want you to see something here. Verse 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land. Take possession of it. Verse 8. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So in other words, God, I need a deed. I just heard the promise in the title. I need a deed, God. God says, well, I can help you with that. I'm going to tell you how it's going to come about, right? Jump on down to verse 17. And here's what God does. And this blows my mind. This is what we call contextualization in Scripture. Please write that down. God does some things that represent things to people at that time so that they can understand that he's a promise keeper. All right? One is at Mount Sinai. That's called a Susurian covenant. It's not a parody covenant. Susurian covenant is a king to his people. All right? This is not a Susurian or parody covenant. This is an unconditional covenant. The reason why it's unconditional is Abraham goes to sleep and only God walks through. Let me read the story, okay? <laughs> this is good. Verse 17, it came about when the sun had set, it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven, a flaming torch, passed through the, the pieces. What pieces? Well, God told Abraham to take five animals and cut them in half. This is absolutely gory. Okay? Cut them right down the middle, and that created what was called a blood path. It was a, it was a path of blood, right? This is how they used to cut covenant back then. Covenant in Hebrew means to cut. And the way, they, the, the way that they would have a deal, imagine signing for your house, and you need the deed, right, to convey the title. And the way you do it is, okay, you go out and you get a three-year-old goat. <laughs> you go out and get a three-year-old heifer. I'm not kidding you. You go out and get a, a, a bird, and, and you, you get all these animals, and you cut them right in half, and you and the realtor walk through. <laughs> I mean, sometimes when you buy a house, that's what it feels like, right? It feels like a blood path. You know, you know, I put my money down and you know, escrow, it's all a blood, blood path. But, but, but imagine this, this is how you sign the contract back then. You cut these animals apart. And the reason why you did it is, stay with me, the reason why you did it is, is because the people that walked through would be saying in a, de a demonstrative way, if I break this deal, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Now, God knew that mankind could not fulfill all the requirements of that. It, the covenant is unto death. And if you break it in any way, then you're split in half. That's what you're saying. May I be split in half? Come on now. Now we say, oh, that's gory. That's, that's bad. That's me. But think about it. The Bible says the payment for sin is death. You understand why now it took Jesus to come and take your place in the blood path because you and I couldn't, we couldn't meet the requirements. And I want to go a little bit further. Abraham couldn't either. That's why God put him to sleep. <laughs> so you're like, okay, so, all right, so what? Okay, all right. And it says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt. Now, what river is that? Come on, church. I got a map up there for you. See, I don't think you know what the promised land is. The promised land isn't that little New Jersey shape that you see on the news all the time. That's not the promised land. Are you hearing me? We call it the promise. That's not the promise. This is the promised land. What God said to Abraham. When Abraham woke up, God walked through. And then he said, you know what? I'm giving you the land. It's all the way from, watch this, the Nile in Egypt, the great river, the river Euphrates. So that's all the way on the other side that flows through Iraq. Hello, we had Saddam Hussein. He didn't know it. He was sitting on the promise. He's sitting on the promised land. That goes all the way down to a little country by the name of Kuwait. Hello. Right? And God says it's going to be all the way up north. The Hittites, the Perizzites, <laughs> the Perizzites, um, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gishites, the Jebusites, I, and so it goes all the way north and all the way to the east, all the way to the west and all the way down. So a big old chunk of Saudi Arabia is actually the promised land. 
Well, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. It goes through part of Cairo, and that's where the Nile is. It goes over, way, over to the Euphrates. Now, up to Turkey, it should go a little bit higher. is isn't too bad. You don't like the math? Oh, and it's a little bit bigger? Well, good, I'm on your side. Good. We'll put the bigger map up next time. The overall, the overreaching point is, is it's not that skinny little thing that you see on the news all the time. So what gives? You see, there's, there's what you and I see as a reality every day in the world, and then there's what God says is true from his promises and his word. Why does God make a promise for your notes? Why does God make a promise? I'll tell you why. Because since the fall, the world has been void of his word. Think about that carefully. If his creation does not have his word, it has no hope and it's doomed. What redeems his creation is bringing forth the word again. And in order to convey the promises of his word, he needs a believer. Could he do it without a believer? Absolutely. But that's not how he wants to do it. You say, Pastor, why is the sky blue? I don't know. It is blue. And why is the grass green? It is. It is. It's just the way he wants it to be. So he conveys it through a believer. Why do we need believers? I'll tell you why. Because right now, the prince of the air, the devil, is a liar. The world is full of lies. He's the father of lies. And God's truth and God's word isn't currently reigning, but it will. And it is. All creation was made by God and his word, but is now filled with the absence of his word. The absence of God's word is always a lie. Did you get that? It's always a lie. Now, that's what evil is, and I've taught this before. What evil is, is the absence of good. Evil is not a thing. Listen carefully. Evil is not a thing. Evil is an anti-thing. Are you getting this? Right? So if somebody tells you a lie, you don't have to go, well, that must exist somewhere because somebody said it. If it's a lie, it don't. it's not true, which means it's, not in existence, at least the way they said it. Hello? So what evil is, is the absence of good. When God created everything by his word, then he gave it another word. Can you hear that? He created by his word, then he gave another word. Did you get that? Come on now. He created the trees. He created you. And after he created his creation, every one of those days, he said, good, good, good. Are you with me? He didn't just say by the word he created it, but then he came back and gave it another word and said good. Until he got to you and until he got to Eve and he said, Adam and Eve, and he said, very good. What is a lie? What is evil in the world? It's the absence of the good and the very good. That's theodicy and that's a pretty deep concept. But the next time somebody asks you why does bad things happen in the world, you need to help them understand it's only because it's their absence of good. If you and I did more, oh, come on, different sermon. Different sermon. So why does God make a promise? Because by a promise, he injects, he re-injects into the world his word, which is good and very good. We need that, right? Without the word of God, we're hopeless. And so then God reinjects into his creation through a patriarch, Abraham, in through covenant of faith and grace, his promise, so that the whole world might be blessed. How many people, how many families, how many nations are blessed? What's that word? All. Oh, good, thank you. So then God goes and says, I want to tell you how this blessing works. Just give me a few more minutes. <sighs> All right. So God says, first of all, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. He changes his name by adding one letter in the Hebrew. It goes from four letters to five. Why is that important? Because five 
used to buy you a foot long at Subway. <laughs> That's not why. <laughs> I wish that would buy me a Subway now. I think I bought one the other day and it was like, like 14 bucks. And I didn't even get the chips, man. You know, and then those cranberry, have you, have you tasted those cranberry cookies? This isn't in my notes, but come with me. The, they got cookies there with the cranberries. Oh, man, that's a good time. Somebody make me some of those so I don't have to buy any. So five is the number of grace in the Bible. It first kind of shows up here. And it shows up in his name, right? And then he says, you're going to have a child of promise. Oh, don't that sound like Jesus, right? And this child is going to be conceived by faith. Why? Well, <laughs> well, when Abraham hears this promise from God about the nation, about the place, the people, and the promise, how old is he? He's 75. He's 75. When does Isaac come? He's 100. That's five times. What is that? That's five times five. That's grace upon grace grace right so pastor i'm not convinced i'm not convinced well let me give you just a little bit more but wait there's more there are five wounds that jesus receives on the cross amen you know that's true hand hand foot foot spear right paul declares that five times he received he declares it five times he didn't receive it five times but five times Paul says he received 39 lashes, five stones. We know that David picked up five stones when he faced Goliath, the Philistine, which was the seed of the serpent. Boy, that's another sermon. Can you come see me if you have a question about that? I'd love to tell you who the son, um, who the father is of Goliath. I mean, the great, great, great grandfather of uh, Nephilim. But anyway, we'll get to that. Um, there's five kinds of animals that God says we're supposed to use to make this covenant. Remember? Yeah. There's a heifer. There's a goat. There's a ram. There's a turtle dove. All oh, the poor little turtle doves. I love them. And then there's a young dove, right? All five are split in half. God's saying, you know what? It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And then I look in the New Testament, the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, and John kind of goes into this Johine kind of creative narrative the first chapter is really just a retelling of genesis why are we retelling genesis let me tell you because god is redoing his creation yeah. right did you know that he's reconciling and rede redeeming his creation back and then john says well how's he going to do it well oh well, 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 let me tell you uh, verse one and chapter one is in the beginning was the oh so we do need a promise. And then later in the chapter, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So we do need a promised child. We do need a promise. And we need it conveyed through a deed. But this time we don't have to have a human being like a patriarch. We got a different person. This time we get Jesus, man. And guess who Jesus, guess who he shows up as? A Jew. Sorry, Arabs. Let me tell you something. He shows up to save you too. Yeah. Can I tell you something? Have you ever read in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit fell? Right there in chapter 2, it says the Arabs were listening. I can take you there. God has always had a redemption plan for the whole earth. Why is it the promised land? Because God wanted to promise a people to deliver his word and his promises to bless all of us. Man, if I've taught you anything else tonight, I've taught you that, right? Then we get down to the bottom of John. It's my favorite verse in the New Testament. I don't know if you've ever heard this verse before, but you're about to hear it now. You don't have a choice. I'm not letting you go. John chapter 1, verse 16. <laughs> Out of the fullness we have received grace upon grace. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> you just you just thought God had grace for you. God has grace upon grace. But he's going to do it through a promised land and a promised people and a promised child. 
because that's the way spiritual things come to a natural earth. Out of his fullness, we receive grace upon grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, so what do we want to end with here? What do we want to end with? How about this? Let's end, with, let's end with this. Let's end with this idea. Let me set you up for next week, because you need a setup for next week. What I'm going to do is teach next week why God picked this place all together, where all of the spiritual battles, this place has been like a porthole for them for spiritual things to happen and move from the supernatural to the natural. They've all happened here. If you look at a little bit larger map, perhaps you have a better one. Um, Mount Ararat would even be included in that. But if you include, let's see, oh yeah, the first battle was the Garden of Eden, right? God planted a garden in Eden, right? Right, so, so Eden, was at a place where there were three rivers. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's over. That's over in Iraq, right? The river Euphrates. So that's in the promised land. The, that first battle happened where? In the promised land. Thank you, Pastor. You're such a swell guy. Let me give you something else to swell about. Here's another one. All right? So then the flood. Guess where it happened? Right? It was built, the, Noah built his boat in the promised land, right? And it flooded the whole earth. But guess where the boat landed? The upper part of the promised, come on. Yeah. Where did the Nephilim come down? Before and after the flood, Mount Hermon. Yeah. In the promised land. Hello. Yeah. The whole battle, you know, so I talked to a pastor the other day. And this pastor said, you know, I just can't figure this out. And I, you ever get frustrated with somebody, a spirit of slap comes over you? And I love this guy. He's been my friend for years. But he's like, I just can't figure this out. <laughs> you know, if it's the promised land and God led his people there, then why isn't there peace there? And I'm like, <laughs> step back, dude, because I got a hiya coming. Got one of those Mr. Miyagi's coming towards you. The battle for eternity has always been fought here. Because Satan knows God's plan is to bring, what did I teach you? Salvation is of the Jews. And all spiritual blessings come through the Jews. And, this, and if you were the devil, I don't want you to be. I'm not calling you that. You're not the devil at all. But if you were, hypothetically, where would you set up your shop to try to stop God? Where would you put the giants? Where would you put the modern day Palestinians and Arabs, where would you make sure that there was always a war? You put it right where God's gonna save and bless people. Can we take up an off another offering? This was really that good. This is, I can, I'm gonna give you the rest next week. I'm gonna take you all the way through why all these battles happen here because God promised that it would happen here. But I, can I show you the ending of next week? That's nice of me because it's, there's no cliffhanger. Don't you hate cliffhangers? Yeah, I hate them too. Who shot JR? And I wanted to know for a whole summer. You didn't watch Dallas. I did. There's nothing else on TV. Nothing. I was seven years old. I want to know who shot JR. JR shot JR. Okay. Did you watch TV back then? Okay, all right. Here's what the devil knows. That the very last battle's fought here. And that God had already set that up. You remember, uh, Jesus Christ is slain from the foundations of the earth. So where Jesus would die was already picked when the earth was being formed. Right? And where Jesus not only would save mankind, but come back to rule and reign was picked there too. And if, once again, if you knew you had to set up a beachhead and you were on the opposing team, you'd set it up right there because the enemy knows what's coming. What's coming is, is a battle that's going to be fought 
where his son is going to be destroyed and the promised child is going to be king and it's going to happen right there tell Megiddo come on Harmon Valley it's just waiting for it to happen and then here's what's going to be really neat want to have some fun I'm going to spook you a little I got two minutes left ready for a spooking yeah it's a great crowd tonight I can see that it's Everybody's ready for a spooking. Okay, Revelation 21, 16, one of my favorite verses in the book of Revelation. Angel me- measures this new city, new heavens, new earth, new, new Jerusalem comes down. New Jerusalem. Okay, it's not coming down to Philly. Okay, it, it, listen, this has already been decided long ago. It's, it's, not, it's not coming to Finley. I'd, I would love it for it to be here. It'd be so awesome, but it's not coming here. It's coming to the promised land where there's a promised child that's going to be set up to rule and reign and promised people, right? And here's what it says. It says the angel measures the city. And watch this. It says it's 1,380 miles by 1,380 miles and 1,380 miles straight up. Now, you need a bigger promised land to put that... You need one that's bigger. Now... This is the best map I could draw. But you need one bigger than the little skinny little thing you see on TV right now where people are calling it Palestine. It's not Palestine. It's the promised land. And that ain't even, that ain't even a sliver of it because you need a really big, we're talking almost 1,400 miles wide. 1,400 miles up. Can I talk about that? Uh, yeah, this is, this is the part that's... I like to get a little weird. I got, you know, and I'm sure some of you email me. That's okay. I'm used to that. Um, uh, 1,380 miles straight up is where they, it's where the last places we put geosynchronous satellites today. That, that, I, I want you to see something here, okay? The Bible says new heavens and new earth. New heavens. Z, plural. There's going to be a city that is going to be big enough, or there's going to be a land area that's going to be big enough, and everything that God promised Abram, that city's going to be that big. And not only that wide, but it's going to go straight up. And see, you and I just think, and I, I'm not Mormon, so don't freak out, okay? But you and I think that we're just going to be stuck down here in this planet doing a whole lot of nothing. What if? What if that, what if that nation... But what if that city is the capital of the world and in it is the God that dwells among men? At one time called Emmanuel. Come on, church. This doesn't touch you. It doesn't touch you. But now he's with us and we live with him. But what if being part of that city, what if, what if, it's the, what if earth becomes the capital of what if all of creation is redeemed? And what if right here, earth is the capital of that? And then I, I read my Bible in the New Testament, and Jesus says, let me tell you a little bit of a story here. I gave some people some talents. I gave them one, and one came back with ten. And I said, well, good, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you over ten cities. And if cities are starting to be that big, think about what's coming. Think about all the glory that's going to be out there. And think about what's coming for us. Um, There's an undiscovered country. You are pilgrims. You are strangers in this land. You are not just like, you you know that's, you know that's what the word Jew means, don't you? Sojourner. You've never heard that before. That's why they've been all over the world and keep coming back to the same, oh, come on. And that's what you and I are. We are not this. We are not of this world, and there's a world and a creation coming. It's pretty big and awesome. And like Kevin, I'm going to go visit Kevin, and Kevin, I'm going to say, Kevin, how's your city's doing? Kevin's going to go, man, it's great, man, they're flourishing. Well, let's go to the top of the New Jerusalem, man, and squat into space. <laughs> And let's go, let's see what's happening on this other place. And let's see what God's doing over here. And for all of eternity. 
Let's stand in prayer. I don't know. Some of you are like, God, I just, I don't know. Huh? He's talking about Star Wars. Everything that God promised Abraham will come to pass. And that's what you're... <laughs> One last thing. <clears throat> what God... What God has promised... And you know, just like a wedding, you know? <laughs> what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Um, what, what God has said in His Word is going to come to pass. There's a little verse of Scripture that says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word come on what what's it say will never pass away this belongs where it is for the promise that god has for his creation um and we'll talk about ishmaelites and all those other people next next week god loves them okay anybody want to close in prayer